Right, well, good evening, everyone here in the Qubit and those of you watching online. Um, before we get on to the meat of the event, the usual announcements, and I think the first one, looking at the familiar faces in the room, we could all do together, which is, if you haven't turned your mobile phone off, please do so, or put it on silent. And secondly, a serious one, if the fire alarm should go off, then please leave as quickly as you can, either by the entrance at the back or the one at the side here. Okay, so moving on to just a few announcements. Um, our next event on the 30th of November, which was Paul London, who our LTM's uh, Heritage Bus uh, Operations Manager, his talk at Acton, I'm afraid, now is fully booked. So if you haven't booked for that, I'm afraid it's too late. But if you wanted to have a fix of a talk during that week, on Tuesday the 28th of November at the Alan Baxter Gallery, which is in Cowcross Street, close to Farringdon Station, the Omnibus Society have Alison Edwards, who's Head of Policy of the Confederation of Passenger Transport, talking on offering support in ever-changing times. And the talk is at uh, 18.30, but the door will be open from 1800, and it will be open to Friends members. So if you want to go along and support the Omnibus Society, they'd be very pleased to see you. Our next event here is in four weeks' time, and it's slightly different. We are going to have, like we did last year, our annual members' meeting, and this will start at 17.45, when a number of the trustees will stand up and give a little report on what's been going on during the last 12 months and also answer your questions. Full details of that part are uh, on page 55, I think it is, of the magazine if you want to look it up. And if you can't come but have a burning question that you'd like to ask any of us, then you can email it in and we'll pick it up on the evening. If you don't want to, and it will be broadcast live, but only to members, and it will not be recorded for uh, catching up on YouTube. If you don't want to come to the AM, but want to hear the talk, then that will kick off at the usual time, about 16, uh, 18, 15. You can wait outside, there'll be a pause, and then you can come in and, and join the talk in the normal way. Then our next one after that, which will be eight weeks today, on um, the 15th of January, Howard Smith, the Managing Director of the Elizabeth Line, will be here giving a talk on the Elizabeth Line. And um, I would recommend early booking for that one as well. I just think that will be quite popular. OK, so let's move on to the main event. Tonight we are extremely lucky to have as our speaker <laughs> Leon Daniels, OBE as it says there. Um, he will actually be talking about the London Bus Museum, which might be slightly different to what we put on the website, but will be very interesting, I know. I could almost use the entire evening outlining Leon's achievements, which I'm pleased that I'm not going to do. But I'd just like to mention a few. Um, he's currently president of the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport. He's chairman of the trustees of the London Bus Museum. As many of you will know, he was the former MD of Surface Transport TFL and was in charge during very much the successful delivery of the Olympics. He is an honorary fellow of the Institute of Careers, and he was telling me just before we started, he's just now senior warden of the court of the Worshipful Company of Carmen, which I must admit is something that I didn't know to earlier this evening. And of course, he's an advisor and delivered a great number of international transport projects. So I think without more ado, let's give a very warm welcome to Leon. Thank you, Graham, very much. Thank you all for coming. I realise we are streaming, uh, which means that I will be as politically correct as I possibly can, uh, which involves not saying ladies and gentlemen, uh, but welcome everybody and thank you. I'm really touched. So many people have come, also touched that so many people I know have come uh, and slightly worried that so many of my team from London Bus Museum are here, both uh, Peter Brown, who's the Honorary Secretary, and taking notes, but also volunteers uh, and so on. So 
I'm slightly worried about that because some of our volunteers know more than I do. Uh, and uh, But there we are. A uh, bit of a presentation for me. This was going to be a two-hander two with Peter Hendy, um, but he only just got back from his travels uh, within the last 24 hours or so, so he can't be here tonight. Uh, he promises to come back again if you invite him. Uh, and so the other half of what we might have talked about uh, we might get on another occasion. So, uh, really great. This is a series of photographs that may be of some interest to some. We can do some Q&A at the end. Uh, as I always say, uh, questions are very welcome. Speeches from the audience masquerading as questions will be harshly dealt with. So, but uh, we, we aim to finish by half past seven, I think, if the chair agrees. So immediately, this photograph is very important to me. Many of these photographs are important to me. Uh, this is ST922, a vehicle which I've been associated with for a long time since my early meetings with Prince Marshall. Um, this is on Lambeth Bridge, and that building in the background is Lambeth Bridge House, which is where I had my first full-time job when it was owned and operated by what was then the Department of Environment. Um, and Lambeth Bridge House, not there anymore, of course. It's that sort of curvy apartment building called Parliament View. I had a really good view of Parliament, uh, though I was a sort of junior civil servant, um, and out of my room I could see the sort of picture postcard of Big Ben and the Houses of Parliament. So this picture is very important to me because it shows me not only a bus I was associated with, but my very first, uh, very first office job. So my first job in the, in the Department, of Trans in Department of Environment, really exciting. Uh, one of the things I got to work on uh, was what's now the Highways Act 1980. In fact, I was the first member of the bill team for the Highways Act 1980. And that gives me a special place in the history of legislation in this country. I am one of a very small number of civil servants in the box in the Commons that had to get the government to vote out its own amendment because my minister was speaking on the wrong side because he'd misunderstood his briefing. There aren't, many of us, <laughs> there aren't many of us who actually had to get the government whips to get the government to vote out its own amendment. Section 135 of the Highways Act 1980, if you want to go and look it up. It is about lopping down trees in Devon and Cornwall in the West Country. Dates from the days when the roads weren't tarmacked and therefore were full of mud and the Secretary of State needed powers to lop down trees to make sure the mud dried so that the thing was passable in the winter. Complete rubbish, of course, because all these roads are now made of tarmac. But what made it even more difficult was the provision in the 1959 Highways Act was excluded from the Local Government Act 1972. So it was the old counties of Somerset and Dorset and... Cornwall and so on. So you drive through Avon, which is a modern county, went over the old county boundary, and the Secretary of State had powers to lock down trees he didn't want. So that's my claim to fame in the history of legislation in this country. It's a good job. It's a long time ago and was clearly forgotten uh, later. So tonight's about London Bus Museum, where, as your chairman said, I am chair of the trustees. And uh, many of you, of course, are visitors. I've taken this particular photograph, which is, of course, from um, an Ealing film, because in many ways it sort of tells us why in the London Bus Museum we are around and what we're trying to do. We're trying to help people enjoy those wonderful moments from perhaps their youth, or when they certainly were when they were younger, with things that they really enjoyed, which includes the transport, it includes the street scene, and it includes, you know, in this particular case, uh, a street seller. So London Bus Museum, our mission, if you like, is to try and make people feel warm and happy by talking about things that they remember and making it possible um, for them to do things uh, which they might otherwise not be able to do. Of course, you're all members of the London Transport Museum, friends, so I'm not going to ask you for money or donations or anything like that because that would be very bad to come into somebody else's charity and ask for money. Uh, but your trustees and through your chair, we are committed to working collaboratively and closely together. So uh, we're not here uh, competing, we're here collaborating, because at the end of the day, uh, we all want uh, the same sort of things. I often find in a case like this, it is helpful. Uh, people always ask in the Q&A, when did you first really love anything about transport? So I have my photograph of me uh, in my earliest transport, guys. Uh, so here I am, I think I am four, in my very best bus conductor's outfit. Um, and that's how I first, I think, got into transport. Uh, and uh, so people, people often ask, so here's the answer. I've, been in, I've had transport in my blood since I was at least 
uh, four. And as you can see by this, this is a rare photograph of me when I was young without my tongue out. So uh, we're very pleased to have that. So if I then go back into my childhood and first thinking about I was interested in transport and in buses and so on and and why was I interested and what were our resources and this is all we had we had our annual British bus fleets book we had our monthly buses illustrated and from 1964 onwards we had our buses annual uh, and that was the total amount of our resource now just compare that with today when so much information is available online Museums we can go to and visit, uh, opportunities to ride, drive, listen, enjoy, things to download on social media, um, and so on. But it's not so long ago, it's only 50 odd years ago, that this is all we were working with, and all you knew was what these publications told you, m much of which was very out of date by the time that it got to you. Uh, and I then started thinking about this, and this is something we need to do. The movement that brought us from here to where we are now is now a piece of social history itself. This movement of enthusiasts collaborating together, um, their specialist interests, and inside our specialist interests of transport, across bus and rail and aeroplanes and so on, and inside that about maps and tickets and ephemera and signage and so on. So... Uh, there's a story to be written about the journey we've been on roughly since about 1960, I guess, which is 50-something years of progress um, so that we have all the wonderful things we have now, and many of them thanks to the work that was done so long ago. And then I started realising that even we've never properly written the history of how the London Bus Museum which is run by the London Bus Preservation Trust, how it ever got um, to be here. And we can trace it back, I think, to the London Omnibus Traction Society, founded in 1964. Um, and I take us back to there because one of the first things that the lots of people did was to buy a bus. So this is Craven RT 1431 being collected uh, in Scotland by some very young people. Um, several of whom are still alive and very much older uh, today. And the original LOTS arrangements was that it was a blend of information and it was an old bus in which they used to cart busfuls of members all over the country for visits and so on. And it wasn't long, like maybe within two years or so, that the rift started to happen. And that rift was between the people who were interested in the information and the news, what was happening in the future, with the people who were interested in the preservation. So we've got this sort of split which caused the formation of the London Bus Preservation Group, where lots went on to specialise on the news and about the new vehicles and the route changes and, and producing all sorts of uh, publications. And the London Bus Preservation Group was involved in preservation and vehicles. Um, and what was happening, of course, in those days was individuals or clusters of individuals right there buying vehicles. Uh, and they would organise events. And they were really keen to try and establish some sort, of, some sort of museum. So here's an early London Bus Preservation Trust uh, picture, which is one of the very first um, bus rallies, Bus of Yesteryear, um, at Somers Town here, and again, some of these vehicles are still with us, um, but this is early, I, I can't, th this was like unheard of. Now we have these events every weekend during the summer, there's conflicts all over the country, all over the world where you can go. This was like your one opportunity to see these vehicles in any sort of captivity. In those days we thought a good idea was to put them all in lines and make people walk up and down them, which is not quite what we do now. But I thought this was fascinating because here is the preservation movement doing the first attempts at showing what it did to the world at large. Because just keeping it to yourself isn't really very much fun. The only good, the public good, if you like, is about showing it to the world outside and, and getting the, the reception. So out of that uh, comes um, what the London Bus Preservation Group really wanted to do which is to have a building of its own. 
Um, and here comes Depot 45 in Red Hill Road. I'm going to say Weybridge, but it was always called Cobham, although some of the early pioneers never stopped calling it Weybridge, as it happened. Um, this building, uh, Depot 45, a vicar's building from World War II, uh, used by Barnes Wallace and others, partially in connection with some of the things that uh, he was developing, which became Cobham Bus Museum. And the photograph you see here uh, is of the inside as it was first seen. And this is, this is taken from a, 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 an edition of Old Motor magazine. Museum was a bit of an overstatement. It was a shed full of stuff. It was not really capable of being open to the public, although in due course the museum had a series of um, open days. Uh, and, but it was the first time everybody banded together. Um, and there's a tribute here because um, Cobham Bus Museum would never have happened if two people who were preservationist forerunners in this time, Alan Almy and his brother Dom, hadn't amongst themselves borrowed money against their own homes in order to be able to create a loan that would allow the, the purchase of the building. Um, and there was a little group at the time, Prince Marshall, with Alan and Don and also Alan Cross and several others, and a chap, Dave Hurley, who in fact was the first person to spot this building being for sale, uh, who were the early pioneers uh, at this stage. And Cobham developed into something which, looking back on it now, we might think was like a sort of private members' gentlemen's club, except it wasn't with drinks, it was with old buses. Um, so it wasn't really a museum at all. It didn't have any aspirations. It was simply a place for people to keep their vehicles in the dry, indoors and safe, and be able to do some work on them. Um, and it was very successful. And by now we're talking 1972, 1973, um, and for the first time, a home for <laughs> preserved buses uh, that was owned uh, together. So Alan was a bit of an entrepreneur and he soon developed Cobham Bus Museum into also being something of a business, which was a bit awkward since we were in the middle of Greenbelt in Weybridge. Um, and it was a little bit like, you know, if you watch Thunderbirds, um, it's international rescue, but if anybody comes and visits, it makes all these changes and just looks like, like a family home. Well, same here. Every time the planning offices came, this looked like a bus museum. Most of the rest of the time, it looked like something between a scrapyard um, and a vehicle dealership. Um, and, but it was the money from that operation that allowed so much more to take place, which included vehicles which were not owned by individuals but owned by the museum uh, to start to come into to preservation. So a couple of stories from the old Cobham Bus Museum, left and right here. So the left picture, RT1320. Those of you who know about these things know there were no green Saunders-bodied RTs, but there we are. And that's the bus we use for driver training. It's the bus, in fact, in which I learnt to drive for my... PCV test, uh, along with uh, Bruce Swain, Terry Stubbington, um, and one or two others. Um, and it was typical of Cobham Bus Museum of the time and Alan. Uh, firstly, um, as we came up for our, for, for our driving tests, Alan thought he'd better get the paperwork out, found the MOT had expired three months previously and we'd been driving it illegally. So we ended up taking our test on something we'd never driven before, but there we were. Um, and in the right-hand picture, that's RF332, which was converted by the museum into a sort of towing lorry. And here we are in this snow, Alan, uh, Bruce, Terry and I, on our way to Wombwell Diesels in the snow. Now, two things about this trip I've never forgotten. One is that we had a freestanding colour gas stove burning inside the passenger saloon on casters. Every time we turned left or right, it rolled one way or the other. Um, but it was the only way to keep warm. We had lots of batteries all over the floor, uh, loose. And then when we got uh, here at the stop, we got into our sleeping bags um, and uh, had a bit of a kip waiting for Wombwell Diesels to open in the morning. We were very cold. Although, as Alan pointed out, uh, if, the con if the contact on the batteries and our zips connected in the right order, we'd briefly be very hot, followed by being permanently very cold. Uh, and so, uh, in this extraordinarily unsafe um, manner, uh, we would go and collect uh, spares and so on. So, that's the good news uh, on the Cobham side. 
The very bad news is that Alan Ormley was killed in a car accident in 1978, also killed his wife. Um, and, um, and the museum suddenly had to change because he was the driving force and the entrepreneur behind it. Um, and there were quite a lot of, if you like, structural changes from 1978 um, onwards. And like happens with voluntary organisations, we went through various generations of committees. And there'd be committees that did a lot of work, followed by some fallings out, followed by a new committee. Followed, how many times have we heard that story um, across voluntary organisations? But look, here we are in our heyday. Uh, uh, Common Bus Museum in full flood, uh, as you can see, properly occupied and, um, and operating. And it, actually, we are just seeing now the museum in its final days because the committee of uh, the period uh, actually made a very difficult decision. Firstly, it had made itself into a trust and therefore into a charity. It had stopped so much of the trading activity and the committee of the time were very keen that this became a more public-facing museum and not just a gentleman's club with a load of old buses and a Chinese takeaway. So the site was on freehold land in the middle of Weybridge Greenbelt and so it was decided that uh, they would look for somewhere else. And the somewhere else became Brooklyn's Museum, which is only a couple of miles up the road. And a deal was done with a developer which bought the Cobham Bus Museum freehold site and demolished the building. And instead, we bought a 125-year lease at Brooklyn's Museum, which is where uh, we are now. So these pictures... Um, the, the welcome sign is the last thing left standing of the building. The building wasn't actually demolished. It fell over when you nudged it because the building was so old that much of the structure had lost connection with the foundations. Um, frankly, a frightful place in which to keep historic relics. Um, the temperature in it was absolutely shocking. So as you can see in the right-hand picture, uh, we're just closing the doors for the last time uh, on the old site. But what an amazing piece of social history from World War II uh, uh, experimental work through to being embryonic uh, bus preservation as early as the 1970s. So now we're somewhere beautiful. We're at the London Bus Museum now at Brooklyn's, a purpose-built building, which is a proper museum. London Bus Preservation Trust is accredited. It's a recognised charity. Uh, and we have everything you'd expect a museum to have, including a kids' area and including facilities and display units and a shop and all the things you'd expect it to have. If Alan was still alive, he could not believe what he and his brother borrowing money from their parents and remortgaging their houses would have created. But what we have created, they have created, is this beautiful museum that is a very important part of Brooklyn's museum itself. And why does this work? It works because buses are in fact a bit of a narrow interest and there's not really any commercial opportunity for a bus museum. But stick it on a site like Brooklyn's, which has got Concord, which has got racing cars and motorcycles and cars, and has got a VC10 and has got a BAC111 and a wider transport interest. Now you're in a place where people come even though they don't know you're there. And in fact, it's not unusual for visitors to come to Brooklyn's, have a really nice time and say, we were surprised to see the bus museum. We really liked it. And I think bringing what we do to this wide audience is probably one of the better things that we've ever done. There will be people who would rather we had stayed masters of our own destiny. Um, uh, but actually, what's the downside for us? There is none. We get a couple of hundred thousand visitors every year. Uh, today, I was in the museum today, there is nothing more exciting than the sound of happy children laughing as they're in the play area and are driving the 1962 Simmel bus from Chiswick behind a screen of moving video and the sound of them laughing as they're making jigsaws and so on. So bringing all this stuff to the public, I think, has been the most amazing journey. So that's, that's a bit of the social history. Um, what is it we like to do in the London Bus Museum? And to some extent, why are we different from um, maybe LT Museum or anybody else for that matter? Um, we love to go out and recreate the past. So here we have RTL uh, 139. And we've got a couple of actors. 
and we're making this beautiful street scene that just evokes memories that people, uh, people remember. And there's a bit of science to this in museum heritage terms. The most popular period that people like is the period of their grandparents. So there's a two-generation shift amongst the general public. It's what they're, they're, they're it's, it's the two-generational thing. These people want to show their grandchildren what it was like. That's why Beamish has just opened its 1950s street with ice cream parlor and fish and chip shop because the target audience now are the people in their 60s or so who've got grandchildren. They want to show their grandchildren what they do. So we never forget this, this two-generational shift. So here's another one we did uh, a year or so. So there's Interstation Cub C111. But it isn't just the Cub, it's the taxi. It's also the actors. And you see that bus stop flag and post? That's not AI, that's really there. So thanks to Peter Hendy and to the TFL people, we went up one day and took the existing bus stop and post down. We, <laughs> Trueform then put up this concrete post um, that we had, and then um, we borrowed the flag. It's in Peter Hendy's collection, as it happens. So we recreated the whole thing. Those panel bills are real. So we have the panel bills, we have the flag, we have the post, and they're all in the ground in the taxicab road at Waterloo in the middle of the night last year, which I think is just uh, wonderful. Uh, there are a few things when we got there. So in fact, we took the cub to every single mainline railway station in London. We went to all of them. Uh, except not Fenchurch Street, but we went to the others. Um, at Victoria, there was a long queue of taxis blocking the access, so I actually paid a taxi driver £10 to go round the block and join the back of the queue so we could get through. Um, when we got to Waterloo, there was a rail replacement service going on. This place was full of coaches, which we had to get out of the way. And at Paddington, bless us, at Paddington, we got the, um, the network rail people uh, and the contractors, because you know it's a, there was, it was a working site, at the, it still is a working site for the new development nearby, in order to reverse the cub all the way down the ramp and put it on the lawn at Paddington, which is where interstation buses used to, used to serve um, all those years ago. So recreating those things are very exciting for us. People paid, one or two people in the audience, John Self is here, um, paid 100 quid for the privilege of uh, being on this journey. But what a great night. I mean, John, you and I both agree we're a bit old to be staying out all night again. We were. But, but, but to create this was just good. And it's, as I say, it's not just driving the bus around. It's trying to make the whole scene look good. And then uh, finally in this uh, series, uh, this took more arm wrestling to do than anything. But we, there, was a, there was a 70th anniversary we had to do. And we really wanted to do it at Victoria bus station. So we took the whole bus station over in the middle of the day. So this was like military precision. What we actually did was to infiltrate these preserved buses in the lines of 73s and 38s and um, so on at exactly the right place so that despite the different frequencies on the mainstream bus routes, all of ours came to the front at the same moment, which is where we've got to here. That took loads. Um, uh, I, I burned quite a few favours in the organisation that day. But... Um, we were able to get the whole range of vehicles in place uh, here just briefly because we only had three or four minutes because, you know, that, that was the frequency of the 38 and so we had to be, we, we had to be on the move. So, yeah, we infiltrated these buses uh, in, into a series of routes that all run on different frequencies and got them all to the front at the same time, which I think was um, just magic. And, again, if we ask ourselves why do we do all this stuff, well... You can't bottle that feeling, can you? I mean, that is just extraordinary to recreate that in the centre of London in the middle of the day. You know, this is so good. Uh, so, something else in this little uh, sequence which I really liked. Uh, Tony Beard, the famous uh, London uh, transport historian, um, had always been fascinated by, um, by art. This is the official photograph of RT1. And he never quite, none of us ever quite knew where it was. It's actually Ham Common. And he was able to find it because he was able to read what's written on the white strips on that post. So he, when he was able to read that, he was able to work out where it was. And he was able to work out not only, not only um, that it was Ham Common, but it was still there. I mean, the, the, the gateway is a different size now, but it is still there. So we took RT1 and put it there on Ham Common. This was a great... I've never forgotten this. This is a Sunday morning, but there's the... There's the white strip on the, um, on the, on the gate. Um, so I rang the chief executive of London Borough of Richmond, and I said, let me tell you what I want to do. 
So I set, set them this picture of the original picture of RT1. I said, I want to bring this bus onto Ham Common during the daylight on a Sunday morning. Um, what do you think? And he said, this is so ridiculous. I have no hesitation in agreeing. <laughs> Look, uh, uh, now, so to get here, we had to drive all over the grass. Um, because the, the roadway, which you can see, there, I mean, the, and of course the trees are now much more mature than they were in 1939, so the route was a convoluted one through all the grass. We had to take some account of the ground conditions because we didn't want to be sinking up to our axles in mud. And the borough was very keen that we were in and out quite quickly, so would we please not turn the engine off? Which then produced a whole series of complaints from residents about why this bus was idling. Um, uh, and somebody, some... What some person who I'm not going to name came forward to our great rescue and told the residents that with old diesel engines, if you switch them off and let them cool, the emissions get worse when you start it up, so you're better off leaving them running, which I thought was a great answer. May, may, <laughs> may even be true. So, so here we are on Ham Common. Um, it was a day of running on uh, Route 65, so we were in and out very quickly. We didn't sink into the mud. Just where we wanted to part, there was a couple of girls doing Pilates, so move them out the way as well. Um, but anyway, that's, that's a sort of blend of fun, because we've got to be having fun, because otherwise there's no point in life. So we have to be having fun, but wasn't it fantastic to be able to recreate with RT1 exactly where it was in 1939? Now, there was one other bus photographed on... Uh, Ham Common at this spot, which was Q188, the double deck green line coach. Doing that's going to be harder because we don't have the bus, but we'll try. During COVID, we learned that um, we couldn't have people to our museum because we were closed, and Brooklyners were closed for significant periods during, during COVID. And then we th when we thought about this, um, and we then saw what other people were doing during COVID, which is in, if you couldn't come to us, we would come to you. So we got this idea about bringing the buses from the museum to the people. And so we did a running day, which was so successful that when COVID was over, we had to do some more. So last year alone, we did this wonderful day uh, on Route 175, uh, that's me with G351, but centre of Romford now, full of RTs, which is just like how it used to be. Uh, and thanks to TfL, we get all get to do that. And the TfL view, just to be clear, is that a little bit of this they like because it puts them in a good light and it allows the public to see them and it's all good. You couldn't do it every weekend. So there's moderation in this. Um, and I just, since we're airing this publicly, we can't all choose a weekend and have 52 of these because there are a number of countervailing things in the other direction. The revenue loss, um, the consequences for the low emission zone and the ultra low emission zone and so on. So a bit of this is good, uh, too much of it less so. And the cooperation we have had has been amazing. Bear in mind we're blocking up the service, blocking up the stands and carrying people who just wanted to get to work and wonder what all this is about. So 175 was great in East London um, back in the spring. Uh, then we did the 65, which again uh, just brought some vehicles out that some people had never had the chance to ride on. And one of the learning processes in this from when we got to, got to this stage was to remember to have a leaflet to give to people to explain what we were doing because all the questions are, what's this about? Um, and the trouble is answering those questions slows the whole thing down very badly. So we, we had to find some information um, uh, and explain what it was we were doing and, and why we were doing it. And then saying, we've brought the museum to you, now you can come and see us. So we now have, at our major events in particular and generally during the year, people who say they've come because they picked up this message and they so enjoyed it, they wanted to do some more, which I think is a, is a, is a great... Uh, a great position to be. Uh, if, as part of our charitable objectives, taking, the, taking this to people as a surprise, as a just something, it's great. And I remember, I remember Prince Marshall being advertised, being advertised, Prince being interviewed on the television in the 1970s. Um, and he was interviewed on the top of D142 Green Park. And the interviewer said to him, uh, Mr. Marshall, 
he didn't quite say crackpot, but there was an inference that this was sort of a mad thing to do. And Prince said, when we drive our old bus down the street, people look up and smile. And if what we do is to make people happy, then that's really the reason to do it. I mean, obviously, there's the history and the heritage and all the rest of it, but it made people happy. And, as a, and he, he went on to say that uh, making people happy is a really important part of, of, of what we do. So, pause for a glass of water. <coughs> so what's going on inside the London Bus Museum right now? Well, hopefully nothing, because it's shut, but... <laughs> we are unbelievably doing three restorations in parallel. Right now, at, during the course of the working day, we are doing three restorations, one beside the other. So here's NS174. Um, this is being made out of three. Um, much of the bodies had to be renewed. We've literally, as you can see in these photographs, just got the front scuttle and the bonnet side. So the bonnet side is actually in <coughs> aluminium. It's a template. It goes away and gets come back, comes back in steel. So, so NS174 is making progress. This restoration we're doing in the main body of the museum. The public can see this happening. It's one of their favourite things they like. They like to wander around the museum, see some exhibits, see some audio visuals, look at some posters, play in the kids' area, especially if they're kids, and then watch this restoration actually taking place around them and engage with the people who are doing it. Bit of a nuisance, really. It slows the volunteers down because they keep stopping to talk. But what a lovely thing to do. People like to see all this. Um, so there's the new upper deck, uh, now broadly complete, and the seats. Um, a wonderful volunteer. Not only is he a brilliant carpenter, he used to make exhibition furniture. He's used to making small chairs. It's really good. Um, and there's the inside of NS174. And that's progressing really uh, well. And as I say, people in the museum can see it. Uh, and what do we see here? We see the cab, which is gradually now coming together. And that whole back end and the staircase is new. So that has, has all been fabricated from, uh, from drawings. Uh, everything about that staircase is difficult to do. The curvature, uh, the size, the sweep. Uh, each of the stairs is a different size. Um, and, of course, some people will say, but this is all new and really not authentic. Well, there's two choices. You either don't have a staircase at all because there was nothing left of the original. And secondly, as we know from some of the drawings that Doug has done um, and the measurements, the... None of these measurements are standard at this stage. In the 1910s and 1920s, they were made, they were hand-built by craftsmen, all of whom had different tolerances. So frankly, you can't say it's right or wrong because they were all very slightly different and everything about them that craftsmen made were very, uh, weren't, weren't common. So only when we got to jig building did anything start to be as, as common as this. So NS174, well on the way, uh, just a bit... To quote, to quote the man who's doing my kitchen, just a bit of clearing up and we'll be finished. But, but I, reckon, I reckon we're a couple of years away now to um, getting this finished. It'll be an open top in general livery. Um, and for those of you who know, we have Dennis D142, which is in blue London public livery. And one of the reasons the Dennis is in blue is we wanted something to show the pirate era, and London public is the only thing we can do with the Dennis on pneumatics. And NS174, which will be on solids, will be our red open top uh, vehicle of the period. Meanwhile, whilst we're working on NS174, we have this four light horse bus underway as well. And this is the first time we have ever attempted a horse bus on our own. Normally they've gone out to Andrews or others. This time we're doing it because we happen to have another expert carpenter um, who used to be an architect. Uh, nothing he likes better than working with wood. So um, we're in the process here of dealing with uh, NS174. Uh, a complete new upper deck, floor and seats work on the side rails. The important, the chassis bit is all, is all fine. And so this is all proceeding uh, now. Uh, so there's the view inside. Much of the, much of the work on the inside is done. And, oh, I'm sorry. And, and on the right-hand photograph, you'll see uh, what we're dealing with in terms of, uh, of platform and, and what's left. So horse bus is underway in parallel and I expect it to be out uh, next year. And then while we're doing that, we're also doing T448. So T448 is a 99 Greenline coach, 
going to ask you for a bit of help in a minute. This is audience participation phase. Um, so what's the situation on this? Uh, well, the interior is largely done. All the floor is done. All the rec scene is done. All the coving panels are done. All the power is in. The lights are in. Waiting for the seats. Um, and so here's the question. Where on a 99 should the fare chart be? It's not at the front because the clock is in the way. And records suggest the fare chart is on the rear emergency door. But all the photographs, does this point? There we are. So it, it would be there. So there's, <laughs> there's the clock. There's the heater. So the only other place for the fare chart then is there. But all the photographs of them new have got a fire extinguisher right there. So question, ladies and gentlemen, anybody know now? Let me know. Write to me later. Don't care. Um, where was the fair chart? We're also slightly wondering about this. This is above the bulkhead on the entrance door. It looks for all the world like a fair chart holder. You know, it's a, it's a wooden frame glazed, and it's got a budget lock and a hinge. Except I've never seen a fair chart of that dimension anywhere. So open question. If it's not there, and it's not there, is it there? If so, what does a fair chart that shape look like? And if that's not the fair chart holder, what is it? Uh, so answers to all of that, welcome, please, at, uh, at our email address. Be really interested to get your answers on that um, as part of, the, part of the research. So what else are we doing? That's our three restorations. Back in 2019, we did something that the committee thought was wild, which is we brought the whole collection together, because much of the collection is in store off-site, and those vehicles are rotated through the Brooklyn site. So we have three outside stores, and twice as many vehicles as we can display are in those store areas, and they get rotated around. So in 2019, we brought a lot together. So LT Museum sent a scooter, um, and we parked it next to our scooter, which is not quite in as good condition. But we brought the whole fleet together, and then we asked all the visitors which the next restoration project should be. And overwhelmingly, it was T357, which was rescued by us 20 years ago from France. Um, it is a 5T4, so as a, as a T357 is one that was built with some local bodies and rebodied uh, later by Wayman. So Wayman, of course, at Adelston, like down the road from Brooklands, and it ran on the 462 in Weybridge area. So it's very local to us. And it's one of the ones that was converted to run on producer gas, which we would like to replicate. So those of you who are concerned about the ultra-low emission zone, we are planning to burn anthracite in a stove on a trailer on the back of the bus and in order to produce some gas to make it go. See you in court. So um, anyway, before we get anywhere near <coughs> anthracite burning <coughs> trailers, uh, let's look at the vehicle itself uh, in a very uh, dilapidated condition. And it's our next restoration project. I can't put this one on the workshop because, as you know, the workshop is very busy and all volunteers. This is a commercial restoration. We have got an appeal out for fundraising. You will have seen this, hopefully, in Classic Bus. If it looks a bit like your magazine, that's because Ray Stenning did it, so you'll, you'll understand that. So we are running a fundraise for this. 350000 is the sort of figure to do this. We're hoping to get half of that through public grants and funds and so on, but for the rest, we are relying on people. If you'd like to see me in court defending an anthracite-burning trailer powering a 1930s Green Line coach, please donate, and you can do it through a number of channels. But please donate, wouldn't, please don't donate anything that you wouldn't, doesn't match what you're already donating to the London Transport Museum friends. Great, good. Uh, so there's a few things. Uh, what else can you expect to come down the line in my lifetime? Um, so this is not a London Bus Museum project, but it will be theirs um, in the fullness of time. We have to have one of these because we're going to miss the, the anniversary of the Dartford Tunnel opening in 1963, because it's in the past. Um, but we have to have one of these, don't we? We have to be able to go to the Ministry testing station with a vehicle that's got wide open sides, that's got an entranceway that's at the bottom of a foot of steps that's five foot off the ground. Um, 
And so we have to have one of these. So this is mine, um, and it is shortly going to be restored, and it will go to Brooklyn's uh, for display. It looks like that at the moment. As you can see, some of the panelling is done and so on. But I think the testing is going to be the best bit. These vehicles never passed the tilt test uh, originally. And as I say, there is that gaping hole, hole on both sides uh, where the passengers can fall out. Um, the other thing we need, if anybody just sort of searching around, if you travel around the country or around the world, you see a school that's got those old bike racks, then let's just help us take them from the school and put them on the bus. That would be, that would be really good. Um, and one other project which has sort of come to the end uh, this year, but a little bit more to do um, from me, which we have made this uh, rather scrappy looking uh, Routemaster into that, which was in its debut at uh, Brooklands this year. It's BEA2, lovingly restored, um, more than this photograph you can possibly believe. Every single screw on this bus is parallel to every other single screw on this bus. And much of this vehicle inside is original because we discovered with laborious cleaning you can make it look as good as new without replacing. So all the checker plate and stuff inside. Some things during the research about BEA Routemasters we didn't know until we really looked into it. Because we now realise, of course, that since in the 1960s you could smoke on an aeroplane, Smoking was allowed on both decks on BEA Routemasters. And we know that because we found the fixings for the ashtrays, which are on the lower deck as well as on the upper deck. And then we found some signage that went with it. That fascinating. Smoking was allowed. Can you imagine? Somewhere in the TFL archive, there are minutes of meetings where people sat around a big table and somebody said, what about smoking? And somebody said, well, it's allowed on aeroplanes, you know. Oh, if it's allowed on aeroplanes, better allow it on the bus then. Oh, we'd better add some ashtrays on the lower deck. Better change the signage. We'd better make some different rules. Um, there'll have been another meeting somewhere. And it'll be in the archive somewhere. There'll have been a meeting and somebody said, we've got to decide what to do with the headlights. Well, what do you mean? Well, you know, Routemaster coaches have twin headlights. Routemaster buses have single headlights. And country area Routemasters with single headlights run in the countryside. So I'll tell you what, this bus that's only going to run between the Cromwell Road and Heathrow on the M4 better have double headlights, hadn't it? Because otherwise it won't be able to see where it's going. So, so this, this whole bus is full of unearthing mysteries of the London transport bureaucracy that I think we all love one way or another, which is about how the detail of some of this stuff was painstakingly worked through. Because these headlights didn't get here by accident. Somebody decided they needed twin headlights. Somebody worked out that a bus that's only going to go between Heathrow and West Cromwell Air Terminal and it's never going to be more than four foot from a street light needed double headlights. Uh, uh, and, and out of that, there must have been a discussion about those illuminated BEA signs, which, by the way, work, but they're now LEDs. Because they do make the bus wider than eight foot, and there must have been a discussion with a certifying officer that said, you know, if we make these illuminated signs, it'd be more than eight foot, but that doesn't matter, does it? And, and all those, I think, are, all those treasures are contained somewhere in TFL archives or people's private collections or memories, which I would uh, love, to, love to be able to unlock. And for this... This is the same as every other bit of the London transport that we love, which was there were infinite numbers of meetings involving infinite number of people, all of which were producing outputs that were only later in life we're trying to interpret without guessing. And, you know, you know this, is the, this is the sort of historian's curse. We must be very careful. We always talk about what actually happened. We mustn't interpret for ourselves what we think happened because that's rewriting history, which we can't do. And so sometimes we have to... Um, sometimes we do just have to think about how these uh, various things came to be. So, almost at the end, uh, because we have to do some questions, and I know you have loads of uh, questions, please do listen to my podcast, which you can find on Apple Podcasts and wherever else you get your podcasts from. Um, I promise you there's a whole wealth of people. You should really listen to the episode with Stephen Norris, who manages manages a number of things, including to refer to the then Scottish First Minister as Jimmy Cranky. Uh, uh, he manages a series of languages, which I'm not going to say out loud because we're going to be on YouTube, but he managed to 
be quite colourful about a number of, of people. So try Stephen. Norman Baker on here was absolutely brilliant. One long stream of consciousness. I'm hardly in this episode. Norman is just in full uh, flow, which is great. Uh, and there is a YouTube channel where you can see some stuff. Um, and there's all the Facebook and Twitter things that you might imagine. So we are going to move to Q&A. But we can do this and Q&A at the same time. Here's something else we do at London Bus Museum, which is to harness the brilliance of some of our volunteers. Because when we find they're brilliant at something, we try and make it interesting for the museum to have. So we didn't start out, um, sorry about this, sometimes in big organisations, people sit down and say, what do we really want? And when they say, what do we really want? We say, well, here are 10 things we want, but we can only afford five, and here are the five we really want, and now we're going to find a way of delivering those five. At London Bus Museum, sometimes we start at the other end of that. Somebody has a good idea, and, then we, and, and it's of no use to us whatsoever, so we try and find a use for it, and we try and make it into something. This is reverse bureaucracy, if you like. Uh, so I'm just going to go to uh, this video, hopefully. Well, I'm not sure how we make videos play on this system, um, so we will see what happens. But the purpose of this video is, if we ever get to it, one of our volunteers. I can take the sound down a bit. I can talk over it. So one of our volunteers. Put a bit more sound for me, please. Bit less this is every London bus route in London, one by one. So what he did was he simply scraped the real-time information off the TfL output one by one and plotted it on a map. So all 675 routes are on this map. So this is running in the museum uh, as a QR code. Just scan the QR code. That's another donation opportunity. Um, so this is part of what we did. So he invented this and said, what could we do with it? And we said, oh, we'll make this then. So here it is. So there we are. If you t and, and so if you took the sound down a bit further, because this goes on for eight minutes, um, if you took the sound out a bit further, give me a, leave, me a, leave me a bit of sound, leave me a bit of sound, a bit of background, a bit more, that's good. So now we can do questions. How's that? This, this will carry on, this will carry on. If you listen very carefully, the music is actually in three bits. Uh, it changes at route 262 and it changes um, at about 465. Um, uh, that's because the music's three minutes long and the whole thing's eight minutes long. So, so this is running, you're transfixed by this now, aren't you? This is how to avoid questions at any event. How to avoid questions, leave this running. Uh, Super question for you. Uh, when you get to the night bus routes, there are very few bits of night bus roads that aren't covered by day buses. I don't know why I'm going over that point. Anyway. So when you get to N551, just watch that bit of the highway. <laughs> Shout if you see it, all right? So this is, this is a few place, one of the few places in London where a night bus route covers a non-day bus uh, route. There you go. Right, questions then. Who wants, who wants to go first? Sir, at the back. This, is good. this just goes on in the background. Yeah, thanks, it? Leon. Excellent presentation. Um, are you getting young people um, involved in this? Because I'm always conscious that time does go quickly and we need the younger generation to follow on with the excellent work you're doing, both in understanding history as well as repairing the old vehicles. Thank you. So, yeah, th Tony, thank you. About young people. The short answer is no. Young people like to see our output. This. They love it. They like to watch stuff. Um, but in terms of coming to help on a regular basis, only rarely. This is a big problem for all of us in the future. Young people get their satisfaction a different way. We, we went around bus garages with note, notebooks and took down numbers and shared information and so on. Young people have all this information and they are not so good at coming forward and helping. Across preservation, it's patchy. Carlton Colville does really well with young volunteers, but of course they're in an area where, frankly, things for young people to do aren't very high, so they're, therefore, you know, being Carlton Colville, so they do quite well with young people. Um, in Weybridge, you know, you really need a car to get to us, otherwise it's a train fare and a walk from the station. So we're at the worst end of the scale. We're in a, an area that is very difficult to find young people, and the young people that do have to travel to get there. Uh, so we don't have enough. We've got all sorts of thoughts to try and get. You're still fascinated. Still, people are watching this. It's great. 
Oh, we've just missed the, the change in the music. Um, so so the, the answer is no, we're not. Certainly nothing like the rate at which we're losing older volunteers, either through age or infirmity or not being able to drive uh, and so on. Nothing, nothing like. And it is a big problem for us, Tony. So, Richard. 309, 312. Yeah. Last time we did, this is the second edition. It's the first edition, the 60 was missing. People wrote in and said, take it down immediately, the 60 is missing. It's not a journey planner, you know, it's just a, just a, just a, just a, just a visualization. And um, they sort of wrote them. So in fact, if you go on the YouTube channel, you'll see eventually I start to say, thank you very much for helpfully pointing out the 60 is missing. We have lots of volunteers on Wednesdays. When would you like to come down? To which they <laughs> shut up, maybe. Richard. Uh, thanks, Leon, for a fascinating talk. Uh, obviously, history is evolving all of the time. So what's the museum's collecting policy for more modern vehicles? Sure. I know uh, you've got, for instance, the, the Bromley bus preservation yep. group are buying a lot of, of modern low-floor type buses. But yep. Where does LBM stand on that? OK, so the question is about modern vehicles. This is tricky. <laughs> really difficult. Um, firstly, modern vehicles are beyond our technical capability because you need laptops and diagnostic equipment and so on. So most of the more modern vehicles we have, we outshop to other people. So in fact, the Bromley Bus Preservation Group, Richard, you mentioned, has our T23, has SP1. And in general, we go put them on loan to them for them to look after and run on a promise that they'll bring them to our events and we can rotate them through our display from time to time. The most modern thing we have is WVL1. Um, so that's sort of at the upper end of our capability, but even that goes to Falcon Coaches uh, for its maintenance work and so on. So I'm just keeping track, 488. <coughs> so, so, so the collecting, our general collecting policy is we only take things that help tell the story. We take things where they might be lost otherwise to preservation, and, and we certainly step in uh, in, in emergency. Uh, otherwise, it's telling the story. We consider that WVL1 and M6 is as much as we want to say about modern buses with rear engines, really, and SMS369 and EB2, because we have the second prototype electric EB2. That's sort of all we want to say about it, but we do collect and have other vehicles. We tend to farm them out to other people. We let them do the work and look after them and use them and run them and all the rest of it. And as I say, bring them to our events and rotate them through our, rotate them through our display from time to time. Okay, thanks. 969. Andrew, your last remaining mobility route, 969. Yeah. Who's next? It's going to come to an end in a minute. Right, you've got night routes to go. Nick. Um, you mentioned running bands, which are a great draw for the outside buses. Yep. No, sure, sure. No, that's interesting, isn't it? We also notice something else um, where we run our running days. Um, Sometimes there's a special occasion, so like Poppy Day and so on, where there's been uh, donations. Um, and interesting areas. 65 produces phenomenal donations. Um, what did we do the other week? Um, 38, far less so. Interestingly, the donors of Kingston, Richmond, Ealing were much better donors than the people in uh, in, in Islington were really strange. I'm just keeping an eye on it because I just want you to hang on to this bit of road here, remember? Oh, in fact, we've had it now. Sorry, we've gone past it. So. I was, that was your question. Sorry, Nick, that my answer to your question was so long we missed the N551 filling in that bit of the highway. There we are. Um, so just on, on the running day thing, um, uh, it's great that we're just not doing this in central London, that we're doing it in the suburbs. We, we think we're doing loads, but in fact, the people in Romford have only ever had one ever. <laughs> um, we've done the 65 twice, but um, so I think that um, you're right about the local people 
And I just think it's about bringing the museum to the people. So I've got a little idea, Graham, which I was going to talk to you about privately, but I'll just mention in passing. Um, and something I think we and LT Museum and you, we could do together. There is a crying example to run Route 55, which is now the E3, on your Acton Open weekend. Because we could run past Acton Depot and we could run Greenford to Chiswick and <laughs> that's good. We could do that. Um, and it's, it, it'll be a bit more difficult because the routes we currently run are real routes, whereas the, nobody knows where the 55 goes. It's just they call it the E3 since 1968. But there's a, we could have a vintage bus service, <coughs> a heritage bus operation, serving Acton Depot at an Acton Depot weekend. We'll have to get some clever people to work out how people don't just travel for free on the bus and then don't pay to go in the, uh, into Acton. But you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a thing we could do um, for a part of London we haven't done before on a route that's of some historical interest because 55 has been the same for 50 plus years. And apart from the fact it's not called the 55 anymore, um, I think it would be interesting. So it would be good. Right. How are we for questions? Keith. Hello. Um, you mentioned about your collection, and yep. you said that M6 and WVL1 yep. Yep. covered the modern era. I remember in the 90s um, driving yellow buses for somebody. I can't remember who owned the company. And I just thought the non-red bus era is quite an important bit of bus history. Yep. Do you plan to well, show that somehow? So the good news is Bromley Bus Group, as you know, has Capital City Bus 250, which is the one two-door Olympian... Northern Counties, uh, work, uh, Workington, Workington bodied um, capital city bus vehicle uh, that was unique. Um, yes, we should. And I know LT Museum has the Volvo city bus from uh, Grey Green. Uh, I don't think we see enough of it. And um, uh, I think, uh, and we should do more on that for sure. We should do more on that. Um, there's two or three slides left over, which are not part of the presentation. They're just meant to, you know, you were so fascinated by the map. I just thought there'd be other things you might like to see. So. I knew you'd want to see this. Is, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is Boris asking what? what. <laughs> Next question, please. <laughs> Anybody else for a question? Come on, I've got 10 minutes yet. Let's at the back. John. Thanks very much today. That was fascinating. Coming from the uh, steam railway side of preservation, one of the magazines this week is, uh, or this month, is, is full of what are we going to use for fuel in the future. Uh -huh. Have you got a similar debate going yeah. on in the bus fraternity? So it's a question about fuel. Steam railway has it worse because of coal. Um, so steam railway has a big problem with, with the availability of coal and the uh, able to source it and the rest of it. We have got the same in road preservation. So just in this last week, I think it's SO that is now um, not producing um, petrol um, with the right... That, it's now only producing petrol with too much ethanol in it um, and so on. So we are increasingly seeing this. So what, what's the consequence for us? All of our petrol vehicles... We can't keep much petrol in them because it goes stale and you can't use it. So modern petrol goes off and therefore we are um, finding it very difficult. So if you fill your vehicle with petrol and then don't use it for a year, it then won't start. Um, which is a pity because our policy has always been to keep the vehicles full of petrol because petrol vapour is more flammable than petrol is, so therefore you'd rather have a full tank rather than an empty tank. But sadly. So on petrol we have all this difficulty over, over modern technology and no obvious solution and things are not dissimilar in the way that diesel is going uh, <coughs> as well. Uh, what's our answer? Well our answer is to do as much as we can while we can for the benefit of everybody um, and we have to keep pushing through the um, various associations that we're all part of to make sure that the supply of fuel is available to us in the future. Before we, I think before we get to the fuel problem, we'll get to the emissions problem, and I think that is a particular concern. You will understand I have to explain why London has an ultra low emission zone and people who have poor, who have low incomes and can't afford to buy a new car, either have to play 
either have to pay the ultra low emission zone fee or buy another car whilst I want to run our old buses past their houses, um, which are exempt from ULEZ by age. So defending the ULEZ, uh, and I don't just mean in London, but defending the ULEZ nationally continues to be an uphill uh, struggle. Our argument, of course, is that the actual volume of pollutants is microscopic. We're talking about half a dozen buses for a few hours on one day a year. So it actually is microscopic. But in political terms, it's much harder than that because many people who are caught by the ultra-low emission zone in any part of the country, because Bristol has it, and Bath has it, and uh, Oxford has it, and so on, anybody who's caught by any of those is feeling aggrieved. And no matter how much warmth and joy we can bring with our old buses, that doesn't really compensate for the fact that they've had to get rid of their old Vauxhall Astra um, or are paying £12.50 a day. It, so I think, John, before we get to fuel as a problem, we will get into emissions as a problem. We've been very lucky. Many of the local authorities around the country with, a, with ULEZs have followed the London model. And since we wrote the 40-year age exemption into the London model, um, they have been replicated um, elsewhere. But uh, 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 I do believe, um, you can quote me on this, um, we will get into emissions difficulties before we get into energy difficulties. Um, and we have to be, I think we have to be very careful about that. Uh, and so as part of the, all the things I always say with anybody's running days, please let's not have badly maintained old buses chucking out black smoke because that gives us all a bad name. So we only want on our heritage operations vehicles that look beautiful and are, smell nice and look nice but are not chucking out black smoke because that undermines our argument with the legislators about our 40-year exemption. Um, okay, that's good. Um, so Doug very kindly gave me this picture, which I, he knows I may use from time to time. I really like the fact that at Kentish Town you can still interchange on the trains for Luton. I think, so. I think that's, I think that's good. It must be great to, great to be able to change, change to go to the, um, change to go to the airport at a station that's closed. I think it's really good. Another question. What have we got? I'll play the map again if you're not good. Play the map again. Crikey, must have run out of questions. That's really difficult. Well, I've got one more picture. I think this is tremendous. I think it's absolutely <laughs> tremendous. Well, just imagine how bad it would be if a vehicle wider than 15 feet wide wanted to go down this road. This would just be shocking. This was um, this is around the back of Oxford Street. I think this was just tremendous. Um, uh, oh, it was amazing. Any more questions while I'm stimulating the audience? John? Silvertown Tunnel, I Yes. I know just the vehicle. TT4. <laughs> I think John is setting me the target. If we couldn't have TT4 ready by the Dartford Tunnel 1963 opening anniversary, could we have it ready for Silvertown Tunnel? So that's possible, actually. That is possible. That is possible because, as we know, um, by the Mayor's direction, vehicles in the Silvertown Tunnel, um, uh, there's a big priority for buses and an ability to carry uh, bicycles. Okay. Thank you, John. And, okay, one more slide then. I, I really love this. You see, when there's, an, when, there's a, when there's a bank holiday, the weekend is 50% longer, not 33% longer. And I, it just occurs to me that if that's, if that's the arithmetic at the co-op, <laughs> then I think, they, I think they have some trouble. So, look, you've been a fantastic audience. Thank you very much. I really hope you've enjoyed it. I, I have immensely enjoyed lying on the couch for this therapy, which has been me unloading a whole load of memories and thoughts from the past. So I have really, really enjoyed it. Thank you for inviting me. I, I can confirm that, as I say, Lord Hendy will be delighted to come and do his half of this show uh, on another occasion, uh, as and when you invite him. Uh, I last did something for you in 2020. And so based on the age at which we are all growing old at, feel free to invite me back more often than once every three years. Thank you very much. <laughs>